Hey there everyone, AJ back again for the Mighty Gloostick channel. I make videos about Dungeons and Dragons lore full time and have a collection of hundreds of monster ecology and strategy videos on my channel and occasional videos about things like new character classes. If you like what I do, please consider becoming a member of the channel or back me on Patreon and subscribe to me here as I upload at least twice a week. A lot of viewers have requested that I take a look at the latest Unearthed Arcana class options and... The new and I think very elegant psionics class options are a great inclusion there. What really interests me, particularly as it relates to the Forgotten Realms though, is the release of the official Artificer Player character class for 5th edition D&D. Now, I know this is of course a critically important character class to include in the Eberron setting, with all that magic punk fantasy noir pulp science stuff fiction stuff going on there's a lot of other folks talking about it going over the details and the mechanics and the features of the class and sure i'll be taking a look at that a little bit but my real aim in this video is to demonstrate that the artificer class is in no way a new thing to the forgotten realms that the class is absolutely integral to the setting to the history of the world of toral and far far more integrated into the continent of faerun already and there is practically a riot of adventures bursting at the seams which I can now reveal to you. So sit back, grab yourself a beverage, we're about to get deeply nerdy in this lengthy video talking about how the Artificer fits into the world of Toril and Faerun. First off, the basics. What is an Artificer? They are inventors, they are disruptors of tradition, they are discoverers, and they are the real pioneers in the sort of fantasy technology that is possible on worlds where magic is real. They are individuals who use their intelligence to examine how every resource available to them can be used to achieve extraordinary results. They pay due respect to arcane traditions and understand the dangers of arcane power. They acknowledge the gods and the conduits of divine power. They are fascinated with natural laws, physics, chemistry and the application of construction, tools and combine all of these things to build wondrous items and push the edge of possibility forward often by exploring the lost knowledge of ancient and even alien civilizations. They are curious, bold, and not afraid to pursue knowledge, even in the face of organizations who seek to keep control and strict regulation of advanced knowledge firmly in their grasp. Artificers are scientists, fantasy scientists. Let's take a look at what the uh, abilities they have as an adventuring character class are briefly. First off, they use a 1d8 as their hit dice, and intelligence is their most important attribute. They can use light to medium armor and simple weapons. They are on a par with druids in that respect. They have extraordinary skill with tools and are well suited to exploration and discovery, with a selection of skills that favor those pursuits to choose from. They are used to long days on the road, long hours of study, and working hard to master their craft. They're with saving throw proficiency to constitution and intelligence that is a combination not shared by any of the other character classes in the player handbook. They have the ability to infuse magical effects into ordinary objects using their tools and magic know-how. Exactly how these effects are achieved is largely in the hands of the player and the DM who are telling the story. The requirements and results are all that matters, not how they are achieved. The results are basically the artificer version of the thaumaturgy or prestidigitation cantrip. The truth is, there's just so many different lost arts and fresh discoveries that getting more specific officially would actually impose unnecessary restrictions on the characters and your storytelling, hampering the fun and the freedom to incorporate your own ideas, as well as the existing obscure and weird lore of the game world. I'll be talking more about the Forgotten Realms and that sort of thing in just a minute. The spell use of the Artificer puts these characters very, very firmly in the arcane category. They appear to create items that are expended in the making of magical effects identical to the named spell, which is clever enough. Essentially, the Artificer is now totally reliant on their tools and the prepared items that they create at the start of the day. So functionally, this is their prepared spell list and the tools are their arcane, arcane focus. But there's much more; they're much more reliant on these objects, taking away from them they are much more powerless than a wizard, but then wizards are powerless if you take away their spell components or arcane focus as well. 
Where the artificer towers over other classes is their mastery of magical items and their ability to aid the skill roles of other members in the adventuring party. The ability they gain as they reach high levels to attune to more and more magical items at a time has massive benefits if the character manages to get their hands on or create a host of powerful magical items. Basically, the artificer can artificially elevate themselves to superhuman near divine levels of power through their reliance on potent magical enhancement to extend beyond any other character class. They are not subject to the possible dictates of some otherworldly patron like the warlock or the cleric. They're not subject to the limits of nature like the druid. A very high level artificer can master magical artifacts and attain enormous power and they can become extremely wealthy thanks to the ability to create magical items and sell them. Artificers are well known for their ability to create their own servants in the form of a homunculus, but also more complex and robust creations later on as they master their skills. Unlike wizards, their art is not recorded in hefty spell books, though they probably keep pretty detailed journals, and we'll talk about that in the Clerics of Gond later on. They don't have the same issues with the knowledge constantly trying to skitter out of their brain every time they use it. Once they reach third level, they take a more specialist path and become known as either alchemists, artillerists, or battlesmiths. But most, uh, more on those distinctions in a minute. Rather, I need to impress on you just why the world of Toril is called the Forgotten Realms. As we descend into a freshly constructed airship, lighter than air gases created in partnership with air Janazi visitors from the elemental planes, gnomish test pilots, acolytes, whisper their admiration and praises of the god Gond as they dock, dock at the soaring spires of Gondite Cathedral on the bustling and rebuilt island nation of Lantern in the southern Sword Coast region. The smoke powder being crafted by the alchemist priests in accordance with Gond's sacred ritual instructions packed into barrels with blessings and price tags, hoisted into platforms containers by mighty shield guardian golems, all destined for the foreign market and the lords of Faerun who can afford them. It seems pretty advanced, but this centre of technological development is merely the most current. The history of technology on Faerun goes back far longer than every civilization that has existed on Earth. So let me put the history of Faerun into some perspective in relation to that of our planet. Current year on Faerun, using the Dale Reckoning, is 1763 DR. We actually set all of the published material in the source books hundreds of years in the past. So in the latest adventures, it's 1493 DR, which is actually 1750 AD on Earth. If we go back to the first civilization on Toril, after the planet thawed out from being completely frozen over, it was the rise of the reptilian Saruk Empire on the shores of what is now the Chultan Peninsula along the jungles of that whole tropical region. This was minus 34,742 BC, around the time humans were first domesticating dogs and the very earliest carved objects have ever been found that, that, well, have been found that were made at that time. We call this time the Upper Paleolithic, but on Toril, it was the age of the first creator race, or the age of scaly kind. The Saruk rose to great power in the name of their serpent gods, and developed magic along with technology, constructing powerful artifacts and advanced alchemical formula, one of which is vital to the Yonti race, the so-called Black Syrup. The Saruk bioengineered engineered many of the uh, main races of intelligent reptiles still active on the world of Toril to this day, but their empire eventually fell. But it left behind lots of legacy. The reptilian Saruk were overthrown by the amphibian Batrachi, who also created many wonders and many new races. But in turn, they fell, and the avian Eri rose to dominate Faerun as, uh, in turn, also with a host of races they created, often from more prim primitive species that they documented well, including the habit of recording their magic and any clever inventions they had made adding to the pre-existing knowledge preserved from the previous empires. The Fey never dominated the continent, they chose instead to dwell in the otherworldly parallel plane called the Feywild, although the Lachey and the Ladrin frequently visited. Humans, the last of the creator races, did not rise to rule Faerun until well after the time when dragons and giants ruled and battled each other to near extinction, or after the rise and fall of both the elven and dwarven empires. In that time, the humans have been dominant on Faerun, even ignoring the mighty civilizations of Karatur and the other continents of the planet. There have been many great empires that have risen and fallen, two of which are particularly important to the history of artificers on Toril. The first is Amaskar, who rose up on the fertile plains as what, on what is now the Roran Desert. 
Much like later on the Netherese rose up on the fertile shores of the most northern lakes of Faerun, bordering the fertile plain that later became the Anorak Desert. Emaskari artificers rose to rule over the empire, but their technology didn't spring out of nowhere. It was gathered from the ruins and legacy artifacts of the many civilizations that rose and fell beforehand. Dragons and storm giants have impressive artificer technology. The giants have created many species in their war against the dragons, including the Bahir and the Rock. Elves and dwarves have countless buried secrets yet to be uncovered across the world of Toril. Some wondrous, but many are terrible. Planner travel has always been a factor as well to consider. Any tech that may exist on one world may well show up on another. Even something found on Ravnica could find its way to Toril. The Warforged of Eberron have found their way across the multiverse, as have the Dragonborn from many different planets, some of which have different stories of their own evolution or creation. Any species capable of intelligence has a chance of producing a true genius along the way. Certainly humans, dwarves and elves have produced more than their fair share. With the elves and the dwarves blessed with long lifespans, these individuals can devote themselves for many decades, even centuries, to just one great work of their chosen craft. Brunor Battlehammer and his creation of Aegis Fang is a good example. Humans, although their lifespans may be artificially enhanced, have the mentality of a race with a more limited allotment of years on their world. And the history of humanity is a story of often reckless growth and progress, repeated time and time again. Currently on Toril, the period of darkness and relative desolation is coming to an end. The Forgotten Realms is a dynamic campaign setting that is set in an era between the fall of the last great human empire, Netheril, the last remains of the Elven Empire of Cormanthir and the Dwarven Empires of Shanatar and Dalzaun. It seems like there is plenty of magic and it seems like technology is just below the level of Earth's Europe during the Middle Ages, but this is not a normal state of affairs, certainly from the perspective of the history of the continent or Faerun and its many diverse races. The time of relative stability and low, low technology is coming to a rapid close. Forces are at play that will transform the face of Faerun once more. So let's talk about that, shall we? For over 25,000 years, the dragons of Toril have been subjected to the Draco Rage Mythal, triggered by the appearance of the first, uh, the King Killer Star in the sky, which resulted in madness and savagery. The Draco Rage Mythal was created during the time of dragons by high mages of the elven people. This high magic effect tied a Faerun wide mythal to the King Killer Star, a comet with the effect that encompassed roughly a 20, uh, 250,000 square mile area where the King Killer Star was visible over Faerun and caused all dragon and dragon-blooded creatures to become more agitated and reckless, eventually becoming little more than raging beasts. This effect lasted for from 10 to 60 days, although there was a spell rediscovered by the song dragon uh, Karasendriath that soothed the effects of the Dracid Rage mythal in an individual, but otherwise it was very, very destructive to draconic society and culture over this long, long period of history. However, as of 1373 DR, quite recently, the Lich Samasta triggered an unanticipated rage which lasted for an entire year, the most violent and long-lasting Dracid Rage of all time on Toril. But it resulted in the destruction of of the Dracorage mythal, ending the curse upon dragonkind. This is extremely important to the fate of every creature on the planet, and explains why both Tiamat and Bahamut have taken a much keener interest and active hand in the planet Toril as of late, because the dragons are once more free to rise up, form alliances, and set in motion their long-term plans to completely dominate all life on Toril once more. And this time, there's no mighty giant empire to stand in their way. So it is entirely possible to encounter fairly well-organized, well-equipped, and very numerous kobolds, including kobold artificers and explorers who are actively hunting down the isolated and lost lairs of dragons who have lived their whole lives out of contact with other members of their own race. These kobolds may be well in possession of advanced technologies that the dragons have been tinkering with and perfecting for centuries in the privacy of their lairs. Kobolds are well known to be hardworking, industrious, clever, resourceful, and totally devoted to true dragons, who make use, full use of their handy little minions to further their goals and pad their hordes with gold and jewels. 
Off the coast of Faerun, the island nation of Lantan has faced utter destruction. The whole island chain was wiped clean by having all of its smoke powder and magical reagents explode as the spell, spell plague erupted in 1385 DR, right before massive t- tidal waves scoured the cities and jungles off the faces of the three rocky islands. Then, in 1487 DR, 102 years later, Lantern was returned to Toril as part of the Second Sundering. The Lantanese ships began to travel again through the Sword Coast. People who trade with the rock gnomes and humans of the islands, who call themselves the Lantana, say that the Lantanese are more secretive than before, and that their technology is even more advanced than it was before the Great Disaster. It's important to talk about the driving force behind a push toward technology in the current population of Faerun civilized lands. The gods Melil, Denir, Ogma, and Gond form the group of deities of knowledge and invention. Gond is central to Lantern and its technology. His uh, faith is the state religion of the islands. The heart of Gond's church in the city of Ilal in Lantern is the High Holy Craft House of Inspiration. This monastery is run by a high artificer who is the highest ranking mortal cleric of Gond. Acting as the supreme voice in ecclesiastical matters, and serving in Lantern's ruling council, the Arorge. The Church of Gond consists mostly of wandering clerics who travel from settlement to settlement, finding work as artisans and engineers. The church encourages wealth, but is, uh, it demonstrates the benefits of following Gond. Part of their culture and faith as they travel is for clerics to take samples of any inventions they discover and assist innovators they encounter, filing regular reports to their superiors and bringing back many wonders to be studied within the high holy craft houses. Temples to Gond are imposing, highly practical, robust and boxy stone structures surrounded by porticos. The only internal decorations are sprawling exhibits of interesting items, some of historical interest, some representing the latest work of master crafters from all over the realms. The central altar in each temple consists of a massive anvil surrounded by spinning cogs in a giant machine, and each temple always has many workshops connected to it, like back rooms. You can easily recognize a cleric of Gond. They wear saffron robes, sashes that hold many tools, and wear sun hats. They have great belts of large linked medallion uh, ringlets. In North Faerun, they serve rural communities as tinkerers, carpenters, and civil engineers. All clerics of Gond keep a journal in which they write down ideas for inventions to be worked on and completed. The many journals end up going into special libraries within the temples, the notes transcribed and collected into large tomes for others to study and be inspired towards further inventions. Within the city of Baldur's Gate, the centre of Gondite religion is the High House of Wonders, as well as a great museum, the Hall of Wonders, where many Gondite inventions are there on public display. The Church of Mistra, and now Midnight, often opposes Gond, believing he holds technology above magic. In truth, Gond views magic as a tool to further his creativity. Merchants cultivate relationships with Gond's clergy in the hope of profiting from trading Gonda inventions, which they certainly do, even though periodically an invention of the followers of Gond can have an adverse economic effect, resulting in hostility from other faiths, but for the most part the benefits and the money outweigh the risks and there is never any extreme reaction or hostility that gains much momentum or traction. The Gondite faith, or at least the workshops of these temples, form a perfectly logical and place for the training and equipping of artificer player characters. The somewhat fanatical followers of Mistra and Midnight can therefore naturally fit into the role of their philosophical rivals and occasionally even their enemies. Clerics of Gond can be found all over Faerun, all the way to the advanced Shu Empire in far off Karatur, far far to the east. Speaking of the potential enemies of Gondites and artificers, those who seek out the lost wonders of the fallen empire of Netheril, which literally fell from the sky, may run into conflict with a very secretive but dedicated faction called the Cult of the Shattered Peaks. The cult mainly operates within the desert of Anarok, but several small cells throughout the western heartlands operate, but anywhere that foolish, irresponsible and greedy arcanists and artificers are actively digging up the past, this is this or very similar groups can be found. The cult of the Shattered Peak is named after the disaster called Carsus's Folly, where a super powerful archmage cast a 12th level spell that stole the power of the goddess of magic, resulting in the utter ruination of the Netherese Empire of Magic, as the huge cities built on the undersides of sheared off and flipped over floating mountain peaks came crashing to the ground and shattered when magic across the world of Toril suddenly stopped working. 
In the view of the cult, Faerunians are much better off leaving well enough alone. They recall the arcane hubris that was Netheril's fall, not to mention its oppression of non-humans and, its f- and fight to keep the old ways dead and buried. To this end, they employ a wide range of tactics such as disinformation and theft to outright assassination to prevent ancient and dangerous artifacts knowledge from surfacing again, dooming the world to repeat the mistakes of the past. Cultists mainly work independently or as part of a cell system. This protects the cult from reprisals, particularly against spellcasters. Cultists give, uh, gave and received information to and from one another, one or two other cultists they knew via dead drops and other means to protect themselves. They may also be assigned to protect and assist other members without those other members knowing that they're, that they're actually there and helping them. Above all else, cultists value information and new members are given few orders beside Keep your eyes open and report back when you find information of interest, especially concerning powerful magic or mages, artifacts and artifices. These cult groups have been around for a long time, almost 2,000 years. So this is generations, a whole subculture that exists within the Bedeen Desert people and to a lesser extent within the shamanistic traditions of the Angarth, the Rengarth and the Uthgarth barbarian tribes. It is taboo for these barbarians to have anything to do with the ancient ruins of the Age of Magic. Most recently, the cults have clashed more fiercely with the Zemtarim wizards, and I dare say they have clashed with agents of Thay many, many times. Then, of course, before the Netheril's dramatic rise, after they discovered the Nether Scrolls, which I'll be talking about in another video, there was the ancient empire of Amaska. And I'll quote Lost Empires of Faerun here, such a great source book, from page 64. The mysterious and mighty Emiskari Empire was that dominated the central horde lands some 4,000 years ago began its rise to power in what is now the barren wasteland known as the Roran Desert. At one time, the proud Emiskari claimed all the lands between the Methwood in the west and the distant uh, Katakoros Mountains in the east. After the empire was overthrown, the surviving Emiskari hastily abandoned their cities. The Mulan slaves also left, primarily primarily because they despised their former masters to such an extent that they rejected all things Emiskari. They formed their own um, the empire. The Emiskari built their cities and towns from a purple stone found naturally in the mountains surrounding the Roran Desert. The extreme durability of the stone is the main reason that so many Emiskari ruins have survived to the present day. Such places are quite dangerous to explore, however, because of the many defences. Most ruined Emiskari cities and artificer towers are protected by constructs, usually golems, dedicated to guarding against intrusion. In addition, the Emiskari's great distrust of priests and gods led to the Empire's artificers to erect clever spell wards and arcane traps that severely inhibit divine magic. Some of these wards punished spellcasters with vicious backlashes of arcane energy proportionate to the amount of divine energy released. Portals and extra-dimensional spaces were common means of transportation in the heyday of the Empire, and many still exist within Emaskari ruins. Artificers also used portals to travel through their cities, and particularly wealthy ones even used them to move within their own homes. Most slaves were forbidden access to the portals, so they had to navigate the cramped and narrow streets of Emaskari cities on foot. With the passage of years, most of these aging portals had become prone to malfunction and portal seepage so magical energy seeping out of them. The presence of numerous portals in a single location creates impediments for explorers since each doorway may connect with some unknown destination. Worse still, the decaying portals of the animal plains that once provided the Emaskari with heat and water now threaten to flood the, the surrounding areas with fire, ice, or worse due to their seepage. Who knows what secret lurks in the Far East, but as far as for Netheril, after the Great Diaspora from minus 339 to one uh, to 1371 DR, the greatest storehouses of Netheril's lost lore lie in the heart of Mount Talath in Halrua. The library of Ruamark holds countless texts brought to Halrua by the Netherese fleeing castes of Holly, and the library of shadows holds countless texts preserved by the Shadowvar during the, their sojourn into the Plain of Shadows. Candlekeep also holds many volumes collected from the Netherese diaspora in, uh, into the north and the western heartlands, and the keepers of these books make them far more accessible than the libraries of Mount Talath or the Shadowvar of Tulantha make theirs. Just a point of pride. Most learned folk of Faerun know at least the basics of Netheril's history, and the lands bordering Anarok are home to numerous sages who have more than a passing interest in Netherese es- esoterica. 
Many sages in Candlekeep, Everesca, Halrua, Nimbrel, Silvery Moon and Suzail have made the study of Netherese history and archaeology their primary focus, and they frequently engage in extensive debate over the minute of Netherese life. And that's probably of great interest to your Artificer player character as well. Information about Netheril and its fall can also be gained from the living un and undead beings who experienced it firsthand. Known Netherese liches include Almvor the Undying, several members of the Grand Cabal who dwell in the host tower of the Arcane in Luskin and the Ruins of Alusk. Good luck getting an audience with them. The legendary Larlock of the Warlock's Crypt, High Prince Telemont, Tanthul, ruler of Tultanthar, and also old enough to remember Old Netheril, although uh, he embraced the shadow world of un instead of undeath. These individuals do not welcome inquiries into the mysteries of Netheril. Those who experienced its fall can sometimes be persuaded to provide first-hand recollections, but it was a painful time. And that is just human empires. There's also empires of the ancient creator races, the ruined realms of dwarven and elven civilizations, lost laboratories of dragons, the secret weapons of the giant empire of Astoria, plus otherworldly involvement in many ancient lands and their cultures. You can never tell what lurks beneath the surface of Faerun. That's why it's called the Forgotten Realms. It is a rich environment that is unlocked by the Artificer class in very exciting ways. If you found this inspirational, either as a DM or a player, let me know down below. And also let me know if you would like to know more about Artificers, as I'd be happy to carry on. But for now, please hit the like button if you made it this far. Subscribe if you like what I do. Check out my Patreon for some exclusive content and all the full scripts for these videos. Buy some merchandise, wear your geek with pride, and as always... Thanks for listening, and I'll be back with more for you very soon. Also, don't forget to tune in to Josh over at Arcane Forge for the month of December. He is featuring a lot of dragons, 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 and more dragons. And he'll be illustrating some fantastic dragon pictures and talking all about their lore. Go and check out his channel. Link in the description underneath this video.